Well, hello, Twin Valley Alliance family and uh, others who may be watching. As I'm sure you can imagine, it, it, uh, it feels kind of strange to be opening God's Word with you while I'm here in an empty auditorium. Um, we are going through an unusual time, to be sure. Most of us have never experienced anything quite like this, but we have nothing to fear. Our God is in control and uh, will walk with us through this whole experience, whatever it may look like in the coming days. I'm grateful, aren't you, that our relationship with God is not limited to those times when we uh, gather corporately with other believers in a church building. And um, I hope that during these days you will set aside some time to be with the Lord and to allow His Word to speak to you and to spend time in worship as, uh, with Him. We, we tend to think of worship as something we do when together, with something that happens, you know, uh, uh, at a particular time on a Sunday morning, but of course worship is, is much more than that. It should really be a part of our lifestyle at all times, and perhaps these days will be an opportunity to grow in that uh, in your personal, private uh, worship of the Lord. Over the last couple of months here at Twin Valley Alliance, we've been in the midst of a study from God's Word of the life and the ministry of Moses, and we've endeavored to learn some from, from uh, his walk with God, both from his successes as well as his failures. Today I want to momentarily kind of hit the pause button on that series of messages and instead draw your attention to another uh, passage of Scripture that is found in a book of the Bible that we, that we don't often turn to, which is the book of Lamentations. You may want, if you're watching this, may want to pause the video for a moment while you find that in your Bible. Um, Lamentations is a short book found in the Old Testament, squeezed between the books of, of uh Jeremiah and Ezekiel. It was written by Jeremiah, who is sometimes referred to as the weeping prophet. And the book, as its name indicates, really is a lament, a lament over the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. And as such, it may not seem to us to be a very um, cheery or uplifting book, though there may be seasons in our lives when we may find that we can identify with its uh, message and its tone. But right in the middle of this sometimes a dark and depressing book, we find these words of light and hope. Let me read for us from Lamentations chapter 3, beginning with verse 19. Here's what it says. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is young. Let him sit alone in silence, for the Lord has laid it on him. Let him bury his face in the dust, there may yet be hope. Let him offer his cheek to one who would strike him. Let him be filled with disgrace, for no one is cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love, for he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to anyone. As I mentioned, we've been studying the life of Moses, and last week, ironically enough, we came to the uh, passages that uh, talk to us about uh, the story of the ten plagues. <laughs> um, that was not by design. That is, I, I didn't choose to preach on the plagues because of the pandemic that we're, we're facing. It's just that that's happened to be what, what came next in our study. But you will remember that one of the things that we, that we noticed is that in the plagues, God is in essence challenging the Egyptian gods in whom the people had put their trust, and he showed them to be weak and impotent and false. And in the same way, um, while we may not have a whole pantheon of gods like the Egyptians did, there, there are many things that we put our trust in rather than in God. And it's interesting to me that this whole um, coronavirus thing that we've been living through has served kind of like the plagues did in Moses' time to uncover or to expose the ultimate weakness and frailty and, and inadequacy and the temporary nature of so much that we have come uh, to depend upon and put our trust in. Our health, a, a strong economy, 
um, the freedom to come and go as we please, all of those things and others we have come to take for granted. But really, we have no guarantee, do we? Um, from one moment to the next, they can be taken from us. They've been shown to be more fragile and, and weak than we thought. But in the midst of it, um, God has not changed. Isn't that good news? He, he remains strong. He's still in control, and he is worthy of our full trust and hope. The same kind of thing was happening in Jeremiah's time. If you were to look at chapter 7 of the book of Jeremiah, for example, you would see there how God, through the prophet, is challenging his people um, because they'd put their trust in things other than in him. Ironically enough, in this case, they're putting their trust in the temple. <laughs> we're safe, they said, because you know, God, God would never allow anything to happen to his temple. And so they, they felt a sense of false security, of invincibility. These things may happen to other people, they would say, you know, but it'll never happen to us, in spite of the prophet's warnings to the contrary. So when the Babylonians came in 586 B.C. and they sacked the city of Jerusalem and they destroyed the temple of Solomon that had stood there for like four centuries, it was devastating. I mean, all that they had trusted in was gone. And Jeremiah, of course, had a front row seat to all of this. And the book of Lamentations gives us a window into the impact that this made on the Jewish people. It's, it's hard for us to imagine the sense of loss, the sense of fear, of uncertainty. The world was just turned upside down. Not, nothing would ever be the same again. The closest thing we could pr compare it with, perhaps, it was, is our experience of 9-11. Now listen, I'm not suggesting that what we're going through now... Uh, with, with the coronavirus is anything like that. It's, it's difficult, to be sure, but we'll make it through. But I do think that the words that Jeremiah penned here in the midst of his despair and loss can be words of comfort and of encouragement for us today. In the midst of it all, he says, when the present is an upheaval and the future is uncertain, I look to my God and there I find hope. You know, the truth is that in spite of what some preachers on television may say, we are never guaranteed health or prosperity or freedom from suffering. Being a Christian doesn't mean that you know, we kind of fly above it all, uh, untouched by, by these events. We don't, because we're real people and we are confronted by real circumstances. It can be easy as believers to, to, to kind of slip into a, a kind of a triumphalism as if we could, should expect that nothing bad would ever happen. But of course it does, doesn't it? We're, we're not exempt. We live in a broken world, and we all feel the effects of that. Um, the truth is that there's nothing really new in what is happening. This happens uh, every day. That is, there, every day there are people who are grappling with difficulties, whether it's facing a prognosis of cancer, perhaps, or the loss of a loved one, or the uncertainty of a job situation, or whatever it may be. This happens all the time. It's nothing new we just may not be aware of it because it's not happening to us, right? It's, it's, it's someone else's problem, someone else's experience. What makes this particular experience unique is that all of us, without exception, are feeling the impact of it together. Even if you don't have the virus, it's not just someone else's problem. It affects all of us. But you know what? You'll also discover that the Bible is written precisely to people in that situation. That is, it doesn't try to duck the hard questions uh, about suffering and difficulty. It's actually surprising how much the Bible talks about suffering, about how to face life in a broken world. Maybe like me, you're noticing that more <laughs> during these days. So in his lament, Jeremiah doesn't try to explain suffering, nor does he try to, to give us a strategy to avoid or eliminate suffering. What he does do, as other Bible passages do as well, is insist that God is there in the midst of these difficult and challenging situations. That he understands and he feels what we are, are going through and that he is our companion as we go through it. That is, that, that our experience of suffering, pain, grief, loss, fear, wh wh whatever it may be, um, does not mean that he has abandoned us or, or left our side, but that on the contrary, he promises his presence in, in the midst of it. You know, in, in times like th this, we often find that the extra uh, peripheral stuff becomes less important and that we, we tend to focus um, more on, on the essentials. And, and the Bible kind of boils down our Christian walk to these three essentials. Faith, hope, 
and love, which are foundational concepts, really, for all of Scripture. And last week we talked uh, a little bit about um, the importance of these three things for what we're facing in these days. And, and interestingly, it's really those same three things, faith, hope, and love, that Jeremiah focuses on here in this passage as well. Jeremiah is saying that in the midst of the, of, of the events that turned his world upside down, that he could anchor his life on the faith and the hope and the love that are found in God. Let's think about faith, first of all. <clears throat> when everything else is in upheaval around us, we can put our trust in a God who loves us, who cares for us, and who has not lost control, but who is sovereign, who is, who is all-powerful, and who holds us in his hand. Isn't, isn't that a comforting and reassuring thought? The, the hymn says, On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. Jeremiah's focus here is not so much on our side of it, that is on our faith, but on God's side, that is on his faithfulness, that he is completely deserving of our trust. As, as we said a moment ago, um, we have discovered, as Jeremiah did in his own time, that many of the things that we have put our trust in have turned out to be weak, to be wobbly, to be short-lived. It's not that there's anything wrong with them necessarily, it's just that we can't ultimately place our dependence on them. But Jeremiah reminds us that we have a faithful God. In fact, you, you may not know this, but these verses are actually the basis and the inspiration for that wonderful hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. It's kind of ironic, isn't it, that that great hymn about the faithfulness of God should be based on verses that come out of a book called Lamentations, about the tragic events you know, of the fall of Jerusalem and the, and the destruction of the temple. But it is a reminder, perhaps, that out of some of our most difficult moments can come some of our uh, deepest um, expressions of faith, because it is in those moments that we discover the faithfulness of our God. Secondly, there is hope. Hope is so important, isn't it, in, in times of personal tragedy or difficulty or of national crisis. One of the first and most dangerous things that can happen in those moments is that people lose hope. When the future seems uncertain, when we find ourselves on unfamiliar and uncharted paths, we need hope. Listen, Christians are people of hope. The Bible talks a lot about hope and it reminds us that we have reason to have hope in a hopeless world. Jeremiah found himself in the complete upheaval of his world. And as he contemplates that, as he expresses his distress, his grief, his anguish, he says this in verse 21. He says, Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. And he goes on to talk about his God, who his God is, a God who is faithful, a God who is loving, a God who is good. And what happens? Hope begins to well up inside of him. Hope. It's not that we don't feel those other emotions. Um, but in the midst of them, we have hope. It's kind of like what Paul says to the Thessalonians, remember, when he's speaking about our attitude toward the death of a loved one. He doesn't say that we don't grieve. What he says is that we don't grieve like those who have no hope. And I trust that you will face these days with Hope, the hope that comes from knowing and trusting in God. A world without hope, or a world without God, it really is a world without hope, isn't it? And so we need to share that hope with others. Listen, if we're going to infect someone with something in these days, let's infect them with hope, okay? <laughs> Finally, Jeremiah talks here about the love of God. Verse 22, because of the Lord's great love, he says, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. And again, in verse 32, though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love. Isn't it good to know that God loves us? And, and twice in these verses it describes his love as unfailing. The Apostle Paul put it this way in, in his letter to the Romans. He says, Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger, or sword, or coronavirus. <laughs> of course, he didn't include coronavirus in that list, but if he'd been writing it today, he might have, because, because of course, 
the implied answer is that none of those things can separate us from the love of God. And in, and in case you aren't sure that that's what he meant, he goes on to say, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced, he says, that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow, what an amazing truth. <laughs> Jeremiah held on to that same truth, and we should too. Jeremiah expressed it this way. He said, his compassions never fail. They're new every morning. Whatever we're going through, um, and however serious this whole thing gets before it's all over, God's love and mercy will always be greater. It's kind of like the manna in the Old Testament. You remember that? Every day there was what they needed for that day. And the next day, there was more. That, that, that's what Jeremiah is saying. They're new every morning. Fresh. New. Isn't that what we need? I know it's what I need. I trust that you'll find faith, hope, and love to be your experience today and every day. Please know that we're praying for you uh, throughout these days, as I'm sure that you are as well, and I hope that you'll receive encouragement from God's Word today. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you that you are greater than anything that we may face and that we can place our hope and trust in you, knowing that you love us and that you will walk with us through it all as you have promised. May your blessing, provision, and protection rest upon each one. In the powerful name of Jesus, amen.